Mysteries for Fools, episode one. What's happening, everybody? Felipe Spars right here with my colleague right here, comedian from the Bay Area, funny man, Bush Escobar. Hey. What's up, everybody? Felipe Esparza, and this is the first episode of History for Fools, where Bush Escobar and I, we tackle and we figure out and we learn the history of a lot of subjects. So this is just one subject, this episode, and we're going to talk about the history of stand-up comedy and comedy in general. Yeah. And pretty much the the first time anybody did stand-up comedy. Because a lot of people want to know, you know, what are the origins of stand-up comedy? Who was the first comedian? Who was the first act? Where did they perform? What year did it start? And who were the people all involved? So, I've never watched any documentary on HBO or any other comedy documentary, but I did reference a book. What's the name of that book? Com the Comedians by Cliff Nesteroff. And it, it's a pretty concise uh, version of all the uh, collections. The, he takes, he, he's done thousands of interviews and everything, and he's uh, condensed them all into one book. And then we read the book. I read a little bit more. Bush read the book. I, um, I, did, I went old school, and I just did Audible like a blind man. And I, I, I listened to the book three times. Basically. Doesn't that, isn't that, that might be better though. Did you feel like um, you got a lot out of it? As a com comedian, you know, and I really was, I was like, I'm getting a goosebumps right now because I've always liked um, stand-up comedy. And when I first started doing stand-up comedy, I was like a comedy nerd. Like I was digging in deep, right. like getting old cassettes and videos of Lenny Bruce and all that stuff. But I never knew like who was the first comic or anything like that. Did you when you first started comedy, like like obviously we have our inspirations like Richard Pryor, like you said, Lenny Bruce and stuff like that. Um, did, like, because I didn't think about it either when I first got into comedy. I was more into the comics that were in front of me, not necessarily the history of it. I think as people we delve into what we love and then we look into history, but comedy is not one of those things where I necessarily did that. And it wasn't until we started talking, and then I read this book, that I realized, like, oh, there's a whole history to what we do. Yes. And not only that, there's also, like, everybody that you've ever seen on stage didn't just wake up one day and decide, I want to do this. They were all inspired by somebody. Right. Like, I was inspired by Paul Rodriguez. You know, that was, like, the first comedian. Yeah. And, and you kind of gravitate to Same. a Same comedian here. that's... You could relate to it, has your likeness, has the same color skin, or anything like that. But I was more attracted to Paul Rodriguez. And I always wanted to know who attracted him to comedy. Was it Freddie Prez? Where did he, he come from? What are his what, origins? What is his origins? So that's why we have this podcast now, The History for Fools. And we're just going to break down stand-up comedy this time. And we're going to just talk about um, the first stages with... Which is pretty much was vaudeville, right? Book? Vaudeville. And let's skip a little bit here because I know that some people are going to be like, well, actually, the first comedians were like just court gestures or, you know, and there's actually. There is court, yeah, court well, gestures. Well, there's a little bit of history before we get started on the vaudeville. There's court gestures. And then we did a little bit of native research, which we're going to come out with later. Um, we're like, and, and this is one of the things that I learned is that there was. There was a guy that kept the humor going in every tribe. So amongst people in their groups and their tribes or whatever you call them, there's always someone making things funny. But our emphasis is on American stand-up right now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, man, if you go to a cave somewhere, you know, a prehistoric <laughs> cave, there's a drawing of a caveman whacking somebody with a club. And there's people laughing, and he don't know <laughs> he don't know why they're laughing. So he yeah. starts clubbing other people, and then it wasn't until people start realizing, no, this guy's a murderer. <laughs> that was the first origin. That was of the first word that came <laughs> in. He's killing them. <laughs> That's why it's called killing. And um, yeah. So <laughs> so American comedy does American stand-up comedy, which is our American stand-up comedy, does start with the. Um, 
around the the time of the vaudeville circuit, which is like around roughly around 1914 and a little bit before, I believe. And that was when, um, you know, America had, no, there was no technology. There was no, no technology. There was no radio. There was no planes. There was no radio. There was no TV. There was nothing. There was no live entertainment but the circus and church. Right, and books. It was and like books. you read books, you go to church, and if you had money, you go to the vaudeville show. And there were like these makeshift ramshackle theaters, if there was one. Some of them were like outdoor stuff. And a lot of these places like have not changed, by the way. No, some of them have <laughs> Well, you performed at one of them. Oh, yeah, no, the shittiness of them. Yeah. <laughs> no. That's one I thing we learned that like the, the, like the lower level of comedian green rooms have not changed. How about when you read this book? Did you think... Like, like, because one of the things that I, when I started to read this book was a lot of the, the thing was how much theft there was and how shitty these, <coughs> these people were like, kind of, like some of them were thieves. Some of them were like just bad guys. And I was like, shit hasn't changed. Not the changed. only thing that's changed is that we have like more, uh, electrical mediums to, to put our stuff out there. Yeah. Like thievery was like, everybody was taking from and sampling from each other. And um, it wasn't until um, actually radio came along when people started noticing. Right. Because before, you know, you could go and do the same joke and make a career forever. Right. Well, they did have one thing. And, then, and, and, that's, um, and this is something that we don't have as comics, which I think we should, is that during the vaudeville days, they had a program where you could write down your act, send it in to this place, and they would keep it on file. And if someone stole your act, you could report them, and then they would go through the file, and if it was confirmed that they were stealing, you could sue them. After Vaudeville had gone away and was done with, the, like, I think, like, someone actually bought the facility with the jokes inside of it, I believe, is what happened. Milton Burrow. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's start from the beginning. Vaudeville. Vaudeville. Uh, there's two guys that were really, really uh, essential to this. One of the guys, you guys heard, you guys heard of the Orpheum Theater? Yeah, the Orpheum. Well, was, was this guy before the Orpheum? No, they were before the Orpheum. It was, um, it was, it was two guys, and actually, it started out with one guy, and it was, um, it was uh, Benjamin Franklin Keith, and he started running um, these these vaudeville shows, and then he ended up connecting with another guy named, um, man, what was his name? Keith Edward Albee? Franklin Albie, and so those theaters were called the Keith Albie Run. Are the Keith Albee theaters, and then what would happen is is that like other theaters like Pantages, Orpheum, Lowe's would pop up. Pantages, Pantages, Fox, yeah, Fox, and Keith Albee would come in, and, and so I think it was like I think it was like uh, uh, Keith that his it was one of them that their wives were really really religious. Keith Albee's wife was real religious. Was it Keith Albee's wife? Yeah. Was really religious, and she wanted him to have clean shows. So he made sure the shows went really, really well and really clean. Uh, and then what happened is that the church started to take notice of it. Keep in mind, man, uh, when, before the entertainment, there was always the church. And the church had been collecting money from parishioners since the beginning of time. So you got, uh, peop yeah. you got people that give money and tidings to the church. Now here comes a circus. Circuit cost twenty-five cents to get in. All right. Oh no, actually it cost ten cents back then to get in. So every time the circus would show up, the the pastor of the church or the congregation, whether it was Catholic or Christian, would start noticing that the collection basket was very small compared to last week when oh, the circuit was not was in town. Okay. So then the church would start, you know, start doing a little campaign like Oh, these um, circuses bring nothing but pickpockets, nothing but slime, right. women with tattoos, whores, right. you know, the mongrels, yeah. the worst type. So this went on for a long time. And so, okay, so ringing in Brother and Bailey, they, they, they did something that, that Keith Albee did. Right. They started making friends with the church. Right. And guaranteeing them, no, this is a clean show. This is a clean show. And that's what... Um, Keith Albee or the Keith Albee circuit uh, was doing was they were billing it as super clean Christian safe shows. And what would happen is Orpheum would come along 
with their shows or packages would come along with their shows and then Keith Albee would would do some Keith LB was like the dirtiest circuit ever by the way it was the beginning of what he was like the Bud of Freeman of his time we'll get back to him later <laughs> he was the Bud Freeman of his time never getting into the improvs again um but uh the uh the, you'll the, never perform here again Bush <laughs> <laughs> not in this town um but what happened is is that uh so these theaters would come in and then Keith LB would go that has, you know, the, it's smut, it's bad, it's anti-Christian, the church would attack it, the theaters would lose money, and then Keith Elby would come in and buy it and buy the theaters. And over time, over a very short period of time, they bought all the Orpheum. So it went from Keith Elby to Keith Elby Orpheum. And then they just would just consume and consume and consume. I think there was a few theaters that they left alone. Um, but but most of the theaters were were sucked up by the Keith Albee uh, and if, circuit. And if you were part of the Keith Albee comedy circuit, and keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this right now or watching, these theaters, these horror films, it's not just stand-up comedy. There's jugglers. There's um. There's yeah, every these type are, of these, act. These are these are this is vaudeville. And this Sullivan is, before it's Sullivan. But stand up wasn't at all stand up. It wasn't yeah. called stand up back then. It wasn't Not even considered. No such thing. And and that was the thing is that first of all it was just acts. It was juggling, and then it would be like comedic sketches, and then maybe like a fire hula hoop or some shit like that. And then in between each. Uh, act was like a, a billboard painted billboard that said you know fuck face you know williams is gonna be performing you know his or juggling to the faith larry will be right here. and so i think it wasn't until the palace theater came along and they had hired frank fay and frank fay is could like considered and i tried to do my research on this and i wanted to do something bigger about it but i couldn't there was not enough arguments for all the other guys there are two people when I kept looking up who was the first stand-up comedian. And a lot of people were saying that it was Mark Twain because he did humorous stuff, like he told humorous stories on stage, which to me can be considered a form of stand-up, but that's not really what we do. And, and what Frank Fay was doing was he became the first MC, which is what I think comics are initially are. We're, we're all MCs. I always tell comics that all the time. If you're opening- Bro, I don't host. Yeah, I, dude, that's the thing that drives me nuts. People say that, huh? Yeah, let's break for a minute here and talk about this because back then you couldn't pull stuff like that. Don't fuck it. You'll be out of you'll be out of the business. You, dude, you should be you out of your no business. No complaining now. back then. So let me just say this, and I hope some of the people from back home are listening because I constantly say this to comics. Like, I'll walk in. I'm the headliner in the Bay Area. I always close shows. Sometimes I'll walk in. And they're looking for a host, and I'll go. I'll host. And then the look of surprise on everybody's face, like, you want to host? And it's like, first of all, I love hosting. Second of all, that's our fucking job. As, as comics, that's our overall job. If you get famous one day and you're worth millions of dollars, or you're like Kevin Hart or something, guess what? You're still going to host award shows. I hosted a show. Or no, I didn't host a show. I was on a show where Kevin Hart was the host. Really? On BT back in the day. Okay, so, and that's what we do, essentially. And that's what Frank Fay was doing um, is that he decided, you know, we're not going to put the signs up. I'm going to bring up the acts in between, and then I'm going to do funny shit in between each act. But it's funny how, um, like, to get to this far, you know, with with Faye, it took a long time. Because back in the days, people were still doing, like, um, vaudeville was the Keystone Cops. Mm -hmm. There's always a, a fake cop. And the joke was him hitting himself in the in the groin and nuts right. and that was a big laugh well and that was the thing that was frank Faye was doing he was like i think i believe he was like he was standing in the middle and his like another guy was wearing roller skates and would skate around him and make fun of him and talk shit to him and then the gag at the end is when frank Faye would get upset or something and his pants would rip off and then he'd be exposed <laughs> in his underwear that's like um that spongebob episode i ripped my pants Right, yeah. <laughs> Dude, and that's the thing, though, is that... You know what's funny is that as I go through this book and I read about all the acts, these are all shit that my kid would laugh at. Yeah. Not that I would laugh at. And uh, and they were, and those these guys ha had that tag... Like, that's where Bart gets the tag, like, eat my shorts. Right, yes. And, uh, well, and that's the other thing is that we'll go through in this podcast is that a lot of references, a lot of things that we use in our, in our, in our regular lexicon is 
all, a lot of it's based off of vaudeville. Um, like things that you see in cartoons, even things that you see in show business today, you know, that are just jokes or things. Like, like uh, when you walk to Apollo and um, that guy, what was his name, Sands? <laughs> After we figured it out. <laughs> we finally figured it out. Because this was not in the book, by the way. Right, no, it was <laughs> So Sandman Sand from the Apollo, you know, it, it's like the, the, the black clown on the show. And he would come out and sweep people off the stage. Right. Because, uh, you know, that's how they did it back then. Well, I mean, if you watch old Bugs Bunny. The hook? They have the hook. The hook comes out, pulls you off stage. I never thought that was real to I, I saw in his book, bro. Never thought it was real either. It's totally real. Um, that can became like a cheap running gag for these theaters to make money because people will come in just to watch somebody get the hook. Right. And that was the thing. Well, that's what they started to realize is Henry that. Henry K. Clay, right? I'm trying, Henry Clay Minor. You were Henry close. Clay Henry Minor. Clay Minor. Man, you got a good memory, dude. I don't have that good a memory with names. But Henry Clay Minor came up with the hook. The hook. And if you weren't doing well and you were bombing, the hook would come off stage like you see in the cartoons and pull you off. And right now you can see the hook right now on the screen. That's the hook. Oh, yeah. That's right. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the drama. Wait a minute, where? Um, no, that's the hook. So that hook um, was the thing, and then it created, and then I think there was a hoop is what we read as well. The hoop, the, a person was being the front of the orchestra while the person was performing. Right. And if the, the, the act was bad, he would throw the big hoop and then hoop him Just off the pull. stage, which was, they, got, they would get hurt. And they said they would violently pull him off the stage. And that's the thing, man, is like... Um, like, there was the hook, and then what started to happen was, and that's the same thing with, like, fruit. Like, you know, you see, like, uh, Bugs Bunny, Yosemite Sam, and then they get hit with tomatoes and stuff like that. That's a fucking real thing, too. They would advertise it as that. They would say, come on, this Saturday. Come throw fruit at the amateur night. Yeah, come throw, like, bad fruit at comics or something like that. Actors. The, even though they don't do that anymore, that always has put a fear on performers. Just the name amateur night. Right. Because you know the audience. You in, in your mind, even though the audience is going to be a good audience, They're ready to take a in your mind, you're like thinking, oh, man, it's going to be a bad audience. Mm -hmm. It's amateur night. They're here for our heads. I didn't know that. And when you're new, you think, oh, amateur night, that's for me. Which, for everybody out there who wants to be a new comic, this is for you. You have to go get your ass kicked a bunch before you could actually do real comedy. But... You know, but when you're new, you go, oh, amateur, this is going to be great. And it's just a, just a big, huge shit show. One of the lines I really liked in that book was that everybody pays dues. Yes. Bob Hope, Richard Pryor, Paul Rodriguez, me, Bush, yep. everybody that's ever done stand-up comedy has paid dues. And what I like about this book, what it says is that if you don't pay dues, right, if you get immediate fame yeah. in the first year of four years of stand-up comedy... And then once, once your fame disappears, that's when you start paying dues. When you start working on the road again. What do you think? Here's the thing is, and I've, I've, I've explained this to someone because I've actually gone through it a couple times when you're breaking into that next level as a comedian. So like for me, the first beginning was like when I had a job and I was working all the time and I was only doing open mics when I could. But then I started to get into like doing showcases and then I started getting hired and then I think this is where the hard part comes in of paying your dues. When you have to quit your job, that's the only thing that pays you money, and you're sporadically making money on the road or doing comedy shows, and it's barely enough or not at all enough to cover your expenses. And then I, I think that's what kills a lot of people, a lot of people's dedication, because it's so hard to push to that next level when you don't have a job and you're just trying to like, you're scraping by all these little tiny gigs, these local gigs, you know, maybe you have a, uh, in, in our age, you have a dot com type or what is it? A gig job. Yeah. But to me, that's always been the thing is when you're trying to break out of real life into this Hollywood life or the show business life. And I think the book and history is, um, it's so accurate because that's exactly what a lot of these guys are I going felt through. it you know stories like because I remember reading um, this, this other book it was called Comedy Road Stories by um, this comedian named um, is that the one I killed? 
No, maybe it was called by it was by Rick something. Rich Schneider. Yeah, a comedy book by Rich Schneider. It's called I Killed. I Killed, and um, I actually gave him a story, and they kept calling me to um, get the approval for the story. No way. And I never returned their calls because I thought they were crazy. You know, <laughs> you know I didn't know who they That's were. That's a good book. Everybody yeah, has it. It's make, like a comedy I, I, I essential. Didn't, I didn't make it in. No way. But he interviewed me at uh, Comedy Magic. And um, this is years ago, right? Years I mean, ago. it has to be years ago. The book's like a few years older. Already, yeah, but man, that's crazy. So you had an opportunity to be in that book. Yes. And then you totally thought people were just pulling your, your chain. Yes. And, and I walk every I, I walked up to um, Rich Schneider. And I say, hey, man, I want to say I'm sorry. You know, I got there, your assistant or somebody from your group was calling me and email, telling me about your book to get the approval. And I didn't return your phone calls. That's just a dumb comic. You know how I am. I don't know, though, because we get bamboozled a lot. And in your first year, you get a lot of people who approach you and go, Can you say yes to everything? Yeah, I want to follow you around with a camera. I want to, I want to do this with you. I want to do that. I want to write a book with you. I want to like, and you're like, yeah, 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 I'll take whatever opportunity. And after a while. The guy's living on your couch. The guy's living on your couch, or he fucked you over, or they took your fucking money. And then all of a sudden, because I've had this happen where someone real calls and goes, Hey, man, we're putting together this big deal. And in your mind, you're like, there's no way anybody's going to put me in a book or there's no way somebody's going to put me on their HBO special yeah. or, you know, and it's like, okay, whatever. I'll get back to you, man. And you just go about your business. But speaking of paying dues, bro, how about those comedians back in the days that had to do chores around a the theater just to, to, to lay up? Just, just to lay up, just to like chill. Well, that's, and that was the thing, man. There's so many things back then that to me, I felt like, I don't know if it was easier to be a comedian because the exposure was way bigger back then. Like if if you wanted to be oh a big exposure yeah if you wanted to be a comedian, boom you're a comedian back then. But you had to travel so like like traveling to gigs. This is before planes, right? Like before planes, before any of that, and then even before trains were all one conglomerated like thing. Where like like you could hop. They were on, all connected, dude. You could hop on an Amtrak right now and catch an Amtrak to an Amtrak to an Amtrak to get to Florida if you wanted to out of L.A. But back then it was like, you know, like this company owned this West Coast Rail, and then this other company owned, and then they were privately owned by the states and stuff like that. So if you needed to get to a gig in like Tulsa you might have to take a train down to Texas. And then from Texas, take one into Albuquerque. And then from Albuquerque, take one up to Tulsa. You're right about that. My first gig I did in El Paso, I went on Greyhound bus, and I went all the way to El Paso. Right. Right? 17 hours. Another time, I had to go do the Turismo Rapido, which is the, the fast tour, which is the, Mex the Mexican-owned bus. You know, and... Oh, I've seen those. And that one goes to Denver. And I was like, I was asking the, the the guy at the ticket counter, you mean that that bus goes to Denver? He goes, how did they do that? Well, it drove it drives to El Paso first, okay, and then it goes north to stops at Kansas, then goes to Denver. Jesus, that's like a like a triangle. Yeah, it's something like a um a, a, a triple run, eh? Yeah, I was just gonna. You know what we used to call triple runs? Was, you done uh, triple run? I did triple. Explain with people what that is. Okay, so triple run, and again, this is all related because this is how much they were getting ripped off then, and this is how much we're getting ripped off now. Fuck Dan Triple, so I don't care if he hears this. But Triple used to hire me. Triple was this guy who would hire you, and we used to call it the um, the pentagram of comedy. Pentagram. Pentagram. Um, because you would go to like you jokers. Would go, yeah, you would go up to Montana and do Jokers. No, also there's a Jokers in Richland, Washington too. Is there really? And then you'd and then you'd go back down to um, uh, Idaho, and then you'd go like over into Wyoming, and then come over to like uh, not Wyoming. I'm sorry. So you go to you go there, and then you go back up to Montana to do another place like Jokers. It was called the Black Horse or something. Then you would come down into Nevada and you'd do Winnemucca, and every gig paid you fifty bucks. And it costs you fifty bucks to get to the gig. If you came home, you were lucky if you had if you broke even. And these are the gigs that you do, man, before you have an agent or a manager. Totally. And those are the gigs that you beg to do. You I remember, beg. bro. I remember my first years. It took me three or four years. For no, that's way too long. It took me like two or three years to get uh, Tribble to notice me. 
And then I did triple for like a year. And then one day I remember I was driving to Reno. And I realized I'm not going to have no money by the time I get Jesus home. Jesus Christ. So I just said, fuck it. And I went straight home. Like I completely quit the tour, went home. Dan Tribble called me, yelled at me, called me a piece of shit, and then hired me two weeks later. Because <laughs> nobody else said yes. Totally. He, but he, I don't know if he, like, that was the thing. <coughs> like, now that I think about it, I thought it was because he forgot. Like, I, I thought, well, he has got all these comics, but I think it was that he was pretending to forget so that he could just say, you know, like, like eh, I'll hire you again. And then I did the same thing. I drove out to Reno. Then I was starting to get to go to, like, Montana. And then I turned around and came back home and told him, sorry, man, don't hire me again. Don't ever hire me again. When I first started, there were a lot of runs like that. There was a Pat Wilson run, and she was this promoter, great promoter. And she did everything by like that was a, so a lot of the promoters were working from home, right? And they just had good contacts, and and back in the days, and it, you know like being short with no money. Or I remember I did a show in Seattle, Washington, and this gig paid seven hundred dollars to do a one nighter in Honolulu, Hawaii, and then close it out in Tacoma, Washington, at at the Comedy Cafe. Which was an urban room. So you don't know what urban is. It's all black room. All black people, right? And um, it was so it was packed. So I didn't. I, he, the fool did not pay me. He did. He did. Want, his name was. Um, his name was um, Pierre Stockwell out of Seattle, Washington. Pierre Stockwell. And I, I spoke to Lunell one time. Lunell, the comedian, mm -hmm. and she said, "Oh, baby." Getting robbed by Pierre is a black comedian's rite of passage. <laughs> now, do you remember reading about what would happen if you got stiffed in the vaudeville days? Yes. You were fucked. It, you were screwed, bro. It you was were like fucked so hard. It was like this. Imagine me not getting paid my money in um, Tacoma, Washington, the seven hundred I was owed. Right. But not only that, I don't have I don't have okay, this is how what he he told me that the my girlfriend is gonna it was an Asian woman, I'm gonna meet is gonna meet you at Southwest Airline, and pay you the money. Pierre Stockwell, he's in Hawaii with a broken leg. He was at my show with a broken leg. His drivers were all like ex pimps or something. They drove me to the airport late, and I had to come off. He paid me two hundred in Hawaii, and I had to use that two hundred. To pay for, cover the flight because I was late, right. so I'm already out. You're broke. Yeah, so I have no more money. So if this would have been the 1920s or 1910s, these comedians would would not get paid, and the promoter would take off with the uh, tickets receipts, and then the comedian had no way to get home. Greyhound bus station is closed, and they had very, no, very they have strict they had, bakery, they had, bakery they had, laws. They had trains. Trains. And the trains didn't come. Sometimes trains didn't come for days. Like, you could sit at it. And, and, and that's right. You were, you were just said. They had very strict vagrant laws. Vagrancy laws didn't go away until, like, the 60s. Like, like you couldn't be, like, like, walking around and be homeless like it is now. No. Jay Leno got arrested for sleeping behind the dumpster at the comedy store. Sinbad. Like, back in the day for the vagrancy. Sinbad, what he said in that book. The, that book, um, um, I Killed by Richard... Rich Snyder. Rich Snyder. He said in that book that he thanks every Greyhound bus driver in America. Every time he, like if he's eating somewhere and he sees a bus driver, whether it's a Greyhound bus yeah, driver, yeah, dude. he buys him lunch. Because he said when he was a struggling comic and they didn't have nowhere to get home, some of these bus drivers will give him a, 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 a hand out and say... All right, man, you can sleep in my bus. Like a free ride. Or you can sleep in my bus while I go have lunch. Oh. Or, or, you can, or he'll let him stay on the bus, bro. No, that's dope. That's yeah. a, like, that's really. And I, Imagine, I mean, Bush, you didn't get brought, you got stiffed by that promoter you were talking about. And then he calls the cops and said, there's a, a bunch of vagrants and y'all get arrested. Yeah, and that's kind of how low ball they were. I mean, this is also at a time when. There wasn't so much humanity in the world. And I know it's weird to say that now because we go, <laughs> don't we lack humanity? I, I honestly don't no, think we do. No, not back then. Because, because back then it was like you had six kids and four of them were going to die. And you were lucky if two of them made it and then one of them was successful. Because also there was no... So that's the world we, they, that we were living in back then. So 
Nobody gives a fuck about you. Nobody gives a fuck about what you're doing. If I have money for you and it's and it's money I need, I'm gonna close up shop, keep my money, call the cops, say Felipe, this fucking big ass Mexican sleeping out in front of my theater. Mm -hmm. Get him the fuck out of there. They arrest you. You never come back. I keep my money. Boom. And then he does it again to so the next comic who shows up. Right, and then they just do it over and over and that's over. That's what they're again. promoting Hawaii and that show was doing too. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And I think that's kind of the theme of this right now for me is like, as we're talking about all this, I'm all, oh shit. And as I read the book too, man, I was definitely like, oh my God, this shit happened to me all the time. Like, like some of this stuff happens to this day. Like, a lot of this stuff happens I, to like this I day. Like, I wish I would have known about, well, Rich, Rich um, Rich's book and his other book. It's like, um, and you need to look out for these things. Yes. Because, um, all right, for like um, for example, Martin Rizzo and Johnny Rocket, they say yes to a gig without ever asking for the hotel. Oh man, I've done that. And then when they when they everybody's done yeah, that. Yeah, everybody. And then you when they, think about you it, you go there blind. And then when they get there, the guy said that um, you 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 are gonna they're gonna see how many people show up. Right. That's bullshit. That's so. That's the thing that happens to me too. Um, and, and this is one of the things, if, again, if you're, I, I, I think this is a good compendium for new comics, by the way, now that we're already talking through this, because like one of the things that you should do is definitely get those books, but also like, man, one of the things I do now that I'm so keen on is as soon as I get an invite, you know, we we're just in Albuquerque and the homie asked me to do his, his show out there a few weeks back. One of the things I said right away was flight, hotel, and this is how much money I need because you would think that a guy that's inviting you from California to some other state already in his mind knows that he has to get your hotel and, and flight, but he's shady. So he's not going to be like, get to my mom's house. Yeah. Oh, and that's the other thing that happens. And I think that's in one of the stories in Rich Schneider's book is that I think it was uh, Bill Hicks had to stay in like a basement or something like that of like the club owner's uh, house. Well, my, my first gig I ever did was in Berkeley. Berkeley, California. Yes. And but where I, I, I live. I was booked by a comedian, and he just said, hey, man, my name is Killer. Killer. Yeah. And he goes, I I'm over here in Berkeley. I want to book you in a, for a no comedy show. <laughs> no last name. Killer. I don't know. I still don't know his first name. That's my stage name, dog. He came to my comedy show, by the way. and I still don't know his first name. It was just How kill bright is your future? Killer. When you start out with Killer as your comedy for, name. For, when we got to the, his house, first of all, I didn't even ask in my head, where's the hotel? Like, that was not even in my mind. Isn't that weird? How like, I drove, like, it was the other comedian didn't have a car. I didn't have a car. So he had, the other comedian had his homeboy drive us. So it was the third guy just driving for fun. No. Yeah. That was, <laughs> I don't know how many times I've recruited friends <laughs> to take me somewhere. Every no, no longer friends, bro. None of my friends will drive me anywhere. I have no one anymore. <laughs> we just have each other, Felipe. <laughs> bro, I'm the kind of guy who get a ride to that comedy show, and then I get us to leave. I'm good, bro. I got yeah. me a ride to the next gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so what happened with Killer? Oh, so when we get there. Like everything was a bad was I was getting like signs that was gonna be bad immediately. I don't know why I remember this so vividly that him and his girlfriend were having a barbecue and they invited us to eat, but I didn't want to eat. Right. And I saw the plate that he made and they were going to Berkeley, right? I've never seen a plate like that. You know, and I This is before you were vegan, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. But I've never seen a play like that because we cook chicken, we barbecue it, yeah. rice, beans, tortillas. Yes. This guy had a plate full of delicious chicken and it had lettuce on the side and strawberries. That was it. And that's it. <laughs> strawberries. I was thrown off by that. Why strawberries? Thrown off. Like, who puts chicken? But like, <laughs> I guess they were going to Berkeley. They're trying to be fancy. Right. But they had like a nice cooked chick chicken. And we get to the show. Didn't ask for the, uh, a sound check. Didn't ask where we're going to perform. Didn't ask for a microphone. They gave us lapels to hold. Lapel mics. Lapel to mics. hold. Or you, could, you could put it. 
Oh, you could put it on your on your um on right here on your collar. Right. But see, I'm not used to performing like that. You know, I'm not Robin Williams. So, bro, I was holding. <laughs> I was a young comic. I was holding a lapel like a little roach. What's up, y'all? <laughs> Who's in the house? I would have I would have taped it to a broomstick. <laughs> that mic, that lapel would have been perfect for that little hand. A for little the little plastic, hand that, little that Rodrigo hand. had. The the show ends. Right. He pays us, you know, 150 what was promised. You know, I got the 150. It's a check, by the way. And Luckily, the other comedian and the other the other guy, they kind of talked to these chicks, and we ended up staying in their house, and I slept on the couch. And the next day, we just drove back home, bro. That no, no hotel, no. No hotel, no food, no nothing. After the show, we were on our own. And this guy, Killer, he ended up booking two more comedians the next year, and those guys... When they ask, they ask him, bro, do you guys have a room? Oh, bro, there's no room. I tell you, you guys, we're, we're going to hook up with some bitches like the other comics. <laughs> no, dude. No, they, they didn't. <laughs> there was a guy that, that saw them walking around hungry and cold down in San Francisco, the clubs. And they said, we have nowhere to stay. Bro, you guys were funny. You can stay with us. And they thought they were going to stay at that guy's house. Right. The guy gave them pizza boxes, and they slept in the back of his truck. Get the fuck out of here. Wow. So this is not too far off from, Dude, from those Dude, they days. drove in a car, sleep in the car. This is a story in this book, but it's minus a car and uh, at a railroad station. Like, some of these guys were sleeping in, like, abandoned railroad stations or, like, where a train would come by once a week. And um, now that, that was just what um, every average white comedian was performing at that time. White comedian. White comedian. And man, you thought it was bad for them. Don't get me started on um, African American comedians, right? Because you know it must have been worse. But I, I, I'm pretty sure they couldn't stay in hotels. Well, they had their own uh, vaudeville circuit called the Chitlin Circuit yes. back then. And um, the 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 Jew had the Bosch. The Bosch belt. Bosch belt. But the, there's a story like why do blues singers have so many kids? You know why some of these black comedians from the old days have so many kids? There was nowhere to stay as a black performer back then. So if you hooked up with somebody, you're going to sleep in their house. So they would go sleep with you their had to groupies. Leave something behind? Yeah. So they would sleep with their groupies or whoever right. they met that yeah. night, and that became. The place where you stood every time you showed up. That's why ODB had like 80 kids. No lie. Yeah. That's Imagine how many kids I would have had, dog. Right. Going from place to place if there was no birth control in the, in the 90s. I would have just known they were my kids by the eyelashes. <laughs> yeah, beautiful eyelash, sir. What are you, Aborigine? <laughs> History for Fools with Bush Escobar, What's Felipe up? Esparza. We're so, back. Um, where am I right now? Buster Keaton. Okay, no. Buster Keaton. Well, at the time where Buster Keaton, he was, we know him as a director and a writer of the of the first talkies and the silent film era. Right. He was part of the silent film era. Did Buster Keaton? When, Buster Keaton made it all the way into the TV era, correct? I I don't think so, bro. He started off in vaudeville with his mother and father as the Keatons. That's right, the three Keatons. The three Keatons. three Keatons. And yes. pretty much Buster Keaton was like, uh, he was born for the stage just like um, so Sammy Davis Jr. was born to perform. Like they were performing in front of the, with their parents and Buster Keaton's father would throw him across the stage and he would land on his back. Well, they would do like sketches. On, in vaudeville um one of them was the schoolhouse sketch. schoolhouse don't forget that yeah schoolhouse sketch but buster would walk in and it was like an aggra aggravated dad bit it was always the dad was pissed off and super violent and super and he would um he would come in bother his dad and then the gag was is that his dad would pick him up beat the crap out of him and throw him around and they had rigged an outfit for little buster keaton 
to where like a, like they took a suitcase and they wrapped it around him kind of so that his dad could pick him up easily and throw him. And, and if I'm correct, I don't know if, if it was called Charles Services back then in the He's, 1900s. Yeah, something like that. They they walked up to um, Buster Keaton's father and said, um, you're abusing your son. You can't be throwing him around. Well, because there was he an injury be- related, related to it. Like yeah. He, got, he, he had a concussion from one of the... Uh, from one of the shows that they did. And then they actually created a bunch of child, that incident created a bunch of child labor laws that we still have to stick to, not only in our regular society, but especially for uh, entertainment. Yeah. And Buster Keaton's father's um, response was, because back then, there wasn't, there wasn't so many schools for children back then. Right. And they were not free like they are now. And... So it was, Buster Kitchen's father said, listen, our son, he's performing, he's working. I mean, what do you want my son to do? Go work at a factory like the other kids? Right. And that was a good point. Good because point. Because at that time, Because he was working. Because at the time, kids were working in, in factories, kids were working in fields. You know, kids were, their child labor law was not a big issue like it is. Like, I mean, it's not even a big issue now because we kind of put it, nipped it in the bud. Is, but it wasn't a big issue back then, and kids were working in all kinds of dangerous places. To quote Bay Area comedian Emo Phillips, he has a mm. bit where he says, remember the good old days when kids worked in factories? <laughs> so that was the thing, is that there was a lot of child actors, there was a lot, vaudeville was really fucked up. It was dude. fucked up. It was really, and that was it, because there was also um, that theater that we were talking about yesterday, that was it was in Gloucester. It was all flooded. Huh? It was on a pier. It was a at the pier? end of the pier, and the back rooms hung towards the back, like the dressing rooms. And so, as you're getting ready, if the tide comes in, there's like a foot of water in the room, and people would have to stand on boxes and like get ready. Uh, rats were a big, big thing in all the theaters back then. So you'd walk into Pantages, or you'd walk into Orpheum, or any of the Keith Alby Circuit theaters. And you walk in, it's like a really beautiful theater in the front. And then the seats look nice, but the rest of the theater is a shithole. And it's, they're built horribly. I can't remember the name of the guy right now, and I should have Which guy, bro? Him. The guy that got killed by his own sign. Yeah, that guy's name was, um, well, his name was Ruby Dickerson. Ruby Dickerson. Yeah, and he was standing outside of the theater, right? Right. And he, and he was like, his marquee was on, on stage. Um, Ruby Dickerson. Yeah, I was above him on the on the front of the theater. Performing tonight. And he came out to have a cigarette or something. Came out to have a cigarette. And let me tell you, um, to talk more about what Butch is trying to say here, is that these theater owners were cutting costs no matter what. And how, and uh, for an example, how many um, green rooms have you been in where half of the stuff on that comedy club is in there? And you right. can barely sit down. right. Yeah. Oh, man, there's so many times where you walk into a green room and it's like a fucking storage room or it's just like it's just like like and that's the thing is that you start to get critical of green rooms and maybe we shouldn't because no, actually, fuck that. Yeah, there's a place for us to chill. And there's so many times where I walk. I don't ask for a lot, a desk and a table. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. But there's so many times you walk into a green room. It's cold. We had an issue one time where there was a bathroom was on the other side. Um, and you've had that a couple times. Reno. I, I witnessed it once where the bathroom's on the other side of the fucking place. And you got to walk through these people. We had to put you in disguise. Because it's not like it's not that Felipe doesn't want to be seen. It's just in the middle of a show as their performers are performing. You know, people see this guy. And I've had it happen when we were in El Paso. People just freak out as soon as they see him. And so we had to get you to the green room. So we, we put you in disguise and we would sneak you to the... To the, I mean, to the bathroom. And to me, that's fine, man. And I, I understand that some clubs are like, well, what am I supposed to do? Put a fucking green room in the bathroom. Put a bathroom in the green room. I never thought about I just thought about seats and alcohol. Right. Yeah, no. And exactly. <laughs> just like we don't think about where to stay. <laughs> Bro, one night, I won't say his name, you know, but I, I left my recorder on at a comedy club. And I left. Oh, no. And I heard the comedy club owner conversation. No. He was drunk, arguing with his wife. I don't give a fuck. I closed this place down and make it a pool hall. Oh, wow. 
Was he saying anything about you at all? No, no, just and, about comedy. Just how much? And I pay the comics and all of that. <laughs> he goes, I just, I'll make this into a pool hall. <laughs> I've, I've actually had, so we were at a, because that's the thing too is I don't think, like we do have to give a little credit to these people who run these places because dealing with crowds, dealing with comics, dealing with waiters and stuff like that. I remember I did a show at a place in San Jose. Shout out to the Branham Lounge. They had like a UFC fighter that was their bouncer. He requested the owner that we didn't have a comedy night anymore because the only time he had to get in fights with other patrons is on comedy night. <laughs> it brings out the wolf in me. It, well, you, you know, you, you go up there, you got a bunch of shitty comics. Some guy's all drunk, starts talking shit. And then you gotta you gotta have to tell him to be quiet. And then the fucking bouncer comes in. The bouncer's gotta fight somebody. A lot easier than dealing with drunk people. Dealing like just people are like talk about oh shit. Will Smith got slapped. No, Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. Let me tell you something, man. Milton Berle, he was trying to he was trying to do crowd work. You oh, know, yeah. crowd work. And he walks up to this couple and he and he looks at the lady and looks at him. What is this novelty night? And the guy ended up being a mafia member. <gasps> That's and stabbed, right. he stabbed, stabbed him. Milton Burr with a fork through his chin. Right. And can I say something? Because I kind of figured out when I read that excerpt, I thought he like punt, punctured him and then pulled it back. No, he left it there. He he, he punctured him and then he dragged it down. Because he had to Christ. get uh, three stitches in four different places. That's what I got. Because he said he needed three stitches on each stripe of the fork. So the guy grabbed him. And it was some guy that was famous for stabbing people with forks. Because the other thing, and this is what we'll talk about in one of the other um, uh, episodes, because we have, because we'll get to the '60s and stuff like that. But at that time, um, all mob ran everything, and so you had to be careful who you talk shit to. Yeah, man. And this is the thing that I do want to say to everybody, um, because I noticed. Read this the crowd. When I s read the fucking room, but when I did saw when I when 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 the slap happened. The, the famous slap now. People are like, oh, now Will Smith gave permission for everybody to hit comment. Let me just say something. People have been rushing the stage since the beginning of fucking time. And so this is- We're gonna get a hook for the audience. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. I mean, perfect. Like an audience control? There'll be a security guard on every aisle. As soon as somebody stands up, oh, hook, sit back down. But, uh, <laughs> we do. That would be, dude, that's actually not a bad idea. That's it'll not be, a bad it'll, idea. It'll, it'll be like, um, what happened, bro? Oh, bro, this guy started heckling what happened, bro. They, they, a hook came up <laughs> and strangled him, bro. <laughs> I pulled him out of his seat by his fucking neck. And he fucking, and he rode out. Like a fucking like um the like the clothes of the cleaners. Right. History for fools with Bush Escobar. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll be back, right, Bush? Yeah, we got fun? a few more of these. This was dude. fun, right? Yeah, I loved it. I had a lot of fun. I have we so tried much to, to say. We tried to squeeze as much as we could into this one. We, we didn't even touch, and we it. didn't even touch the tip yet. I, I didn't think we could have. I thought honestly, when we first started, yeah, I was nervous on the plane. I didn't sleep because I kept thinking about it. Really? I don't remember stuff, you know? Because I don't know how to... I know I know how to... Like when like when Lisa and I, we started Enchilada Casserole, and Rodrigo and I, we did a What's Up Fool. It took us a while to get the rhythm, but I got the rhythm right away. It took me yeah. a while. I got the rhythm with you, and we got off track. And I, I, I'm having a great time. Sure. I want to say thank you, man. Thank you, bro. Thanks for having me on. I was nervous. I was just as nervous, too, because <laughs> you invited me on this, and I'm like... Like, because you were like, you know all this stuff about comedy and all this stuff about, no, 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 don't fucking quote me, dude. <laughs> and then, like, I was, I didn't sleep either, bro. We were both on the plane and fucking tired I was, as fuck today. I was getting comfortable because I saw Butch's, look, look at Butch's book. I said, I haven't seen somebody's book with that many notes since my homie had a Bible. Yeah. <laughs> well, now I'm He used to slap, he used to Bible whip me with quotes. <laughs> And Butch is Bible whipping you guys with comedy facts. Well, now I have all this useless information in my head. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, and bro. we'll see you guys on the Good next friend. one. Yeah.